What's up, everybody? So, last week, well, at least last week when this video airs, Canon Rumors posted an article, uh, a rumor about the EOS RS or R5, that's what they're calling it. Who knows what Canon's going to actually call it. And now, granted, I find this rumor to be fairly far-fetched in terms of uh, what I think is based on reality. Uh, Canon Rumors has uh, posted a subsequent update and they claim that it's uh, not, uh, or that they are very confident in a lot of the stats and the rumors, not necessarily that they're 100% accurate. Obviously they're rumors, um, but that uh, they've had people that have contact, you know, at any rate. Uh, and I find from reading through the rumors that, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, I'm dubious at best that Canon would release a mirrorless uh, camera that had 8K video at 60 frames or 30 frames a second, but um, you know, maybe there's something else going on there. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about was image stabilization because one of the things the rumors had was that the camera would have in-body image stabilization and it would be good for five stops of uh, camera shake and it would have, uh, when combined with, I guess, an RF or EF lens or whatever uh, that had image stabilization, it would provide up to eight, seven to eight stops. That This is, again, a rumor. This is not necessarily true, but... Um, it prompted some, of all the specifications in this rumor, this is the one that jumped out to me as being possibly the most far-fetched. Uh, it's the one that jumped out to me as being at least the most problematic. So, uh, before I dive into this, I kind of want to mention that I have not spent an awful lot of time uh, digging into uh, the biomechanics behind holding a camera steady and the uh, limitations of image stabilization. Uh, there's, there's some optical stuff going on, there's some lens design stuff going on, and there's just some straight up, you know, like human biomechanics going on. And there's a lot of things I've dived, dug really deep into in photography. Uh, this is not one of those areas. Uh, so I'm not necessarily talking here from a position of authority. I'm talking here largely from uh, what little research I have done into uh, image stabilization and so forth. Uh, just sort of my general feeling on the matter. Uh, so if we go back and we look at the history of image stabilization, uh, just briefly, Canon's first image stabilized lens was the EF 75 to 300 f4.5 to 5.6 is usm it was released in 1995 and it had an image stabilizer of two stops and uh canon lenses pretty much were stuck at that two stops uh image stabilization uh, metric or level for uh well about six years the the first three stop image stabilizer that i can find was the 70 to 200 f 2.8 l ISUSM, and that was released in 2001. And then the first uh, four-stop image stabilizer that I could find is the 70 to 200 F4L ISUSM, which was released in 2006. So there's about a five-year, like every five years, sort of for the beginning of image stabilized lenses, there has been an an improvement of about a stop. Uh, and then it plateaued. Uh, so um, we get to four stops, then we don't see a whole lot of anything. Um, and like now in 2020, the best that we really see looking at, you know, any brand is about five stops. Uh, and interestingly, I guess, some of the lenses that have uh, previously been rated, uh, you know, a prime example of this is the Canon 70 200 f2.8 L IS USM going from the second generation to the third generation. Uh, Canon used the same image stabilization mechanism between those two lenses, 
but the image stabilization rating dropped from four stops to three and a half stops due to changes in testing methodology. So prior to about 2012, 2014, uh, the CIPA standard I have, or the draft I have, uh, or could find on their website was uh, published in 2000, or translated in 2014. But prior to about 2012, 2014, that time frame, Every camera manufacturer was testing the lenses stabilization using their own standards and they weren't using uh, you know, an industry-wide standard. So there's a level certainly of, you know, you could expect that with standards changing. So it's, it's worth paying a little bit of attention to uh, if you see, you know, if you're looking at things and you see image stabilization performance dropping uh, in newer lenses compared to over older lenses or so, what, so on and so forth. Uh, it may be, in fact, that the testing standards have changed. Um, of course, the other option when it comes to shooting uh, image stabilization is using in-body image stabilization, uh, IBIS. And there are things that IBIS can inherent, uh, in-body image stabilization can inherently do that a lens can't. Uh, the big one is, of course, ro roll. The, the camera can roll the sensor as you roll the camera and a lens Obviously, you could twist the glass element, but because it's symmetrical around its axis, it, it's not going to actually roll the picture. It can't compensate for that. Um, another aspect that I think sensor stabilization can compensate for a little bit better is um, pitch and yaw motions. So. Uh, you can compensate for that to a certain extent in the lens by moving the lens elements, but you have to remember when you're moving lens elements, in fact, when you're moving any of these elements, the whole camera is an operating as a tilt-shift lens, essentially, or a, uh, in fact, a better way to think about it might even be as a, uh, a technical view camera where you have full freedom to move and rotate the lens, the camera, and you know, or the lens and the sensor film and the whole shoot and match. Uh, and this is simply a product of, you know, if you rotate a lens element in a lens, it causes, or you shift a lens element in a lens, it causes the same kinds of effects as if you were having, you know, you were ro rotating, or, or essentially the same kind of effects as if you were, like, shifting or rotating the whole lens. Uh, it's not, you know, so there's, there's more complexity in the, uh, the, the, in, image stabilization than sort of just shifting a lens element. Uh, but obviously it works pretty good because, you know, we're sitting here now on generally at like five stop uh, stabilizers in lenses and cameras, uh, you know, things are pretty good. Uh, but the question is how far can you actually take it? Because to a certain extent, we like to think about technology as being able to solve problems and we'd like to think that the camera can just solve the image stabilization issue or a better image stabilizer and a lens can solve, solve an image stabilization issue. Uh, but the real problem in camera shake, the, real, the whole thing that image stabilization is trying to address is actually us. We're just not really inherently stable platforms, uh, you know, for shooting. And it's important to think about, too, the sort of what doesn't seem like or seems like a small motion to us is a massive motion when you're talking about, you know, moving four or five micron pixels, uh, you know, around. So you're, you're talking the pixels on an image sensor and assuming you want to have pixel sharp as a result of your stabilization process, the, your, your actual tolerances are like, in what the camera is dealing with, they're actually like very small. Now, uh, you can get a, quite a lot out of uh, shifting lenses. You can get a lot of motion. You can get some motion out of shifting the sensor. Um, f how much is going to obviously be dependent on the uh, sensor mount and mechanics itself. Uh, but there are obviously like inherent limits that you run into with these sensor motions. What doesn't really exist is a inherent limit in how far we can move as a person when we're trying to take a picture. And so there's sort of two issues that we come up when you start talking about um, 
our motion as a person. Uh, we have shake, which I consider, uh, and these are my terms, again, I haven't, uh, uh, like, I'm not sure if there's, like, super well-defined standards for this uh, in terms of the terminology, but what I call shake, which is sort of high-frequency, low-displacement uh, motion. So it's the, the little tiny, you know, little, and I'm grossly exaggerating, but the little tiny, you know, instabilities of, you know, as your muscles twitch and so on and so forth. So, you know, you don't perceive it when you're standing there holding a camera like this, but they're that little tiny, those little tiny twitches, they're very small in displacement, whether you're measuring it angularly or uh, by, uh, you know, like absolute or in, in measured, you know, in, in linear units, I should say. Uh, they're very small, but then again, remember when we're talking about pixel sharp images, we're talking about very small uh, tolerances for error. You know, we're talking uh, a camera with say f six micron pixels. Uh, you know, if you move the camera, you know, that's six uh, millionths of a, uh, a meter. Um, you know, that's not a tremendous amount of uh, distance or displacement to, uh, to deal with. The second problem is what I call drift. And drift comes down to uh, when we're trying to maintain position, we have a feedback system, a feedback loop. It's a closed uh, loop process. So our eyes are looking at what we're trying to uh, keep the camera on target on, and as our body shifts or moves over time, the, you know, our brain feeds back and says, you have to move back this way, and so there's a closed loop there. Now, when you start talking shutter-released cameras, uh, you know, making an image, we lose a lot of that feedback because we no longer have a visual uh, clue or visual uh, uh, input looking through the viewfinder, you know, and this is a case whether we're talking SLRs or mirrorless cameras. Uh, the, the, while the camera's making the image, it's not feeding a signal back to the monitor of what's happening with the camera uh, or the viewfinder. So what, you're, what you have is that as, as the exposure times increase, the amount of drift that you have as a person just holding the camera is potentially going to increase with it. And there's some stuff that you could do to kind of play around with what I'm talking about to sort of illustrate it for yourself if you, you know, wanted to look at it. Uh, for uh, Shake, you can grab, uh, there's tons of accelerometer apps out there for various smartphones, Android, iOS, doesn't matter. I don't have a recommendation is which one you use isn't all that important. But if you grab an accelerometer app for your phone and you try to hold your phone stable, as stable as you look and think you're going to hold, you're holding your phone, you will see that there's a lot of uh, perturbation in the accelerometer graph that that app produces. Now, some of that is going to be just noise inherent in the accelerometer. But a lot of that is going to be just your micro shake. Uh, the other test that you can do to sort of understand or see what I'm talking about with respect to drift is try to hold your finger fixed relative to a, a, an absolute object. Like in this case, like I could point at this side of the camera. And as long as I'm looking at my finger, I can keep adjusting my finger to be pointed in the same place. But when I look at the camera, my finger drifts. Now, the drift isn't huge in terms of like, I mean, I'm not over here or something like that. Uh, but if my finger drifts a half an inch in two seconds or something like that, that's what the camera's image stabilization system potentially, and again, this is not all like 100% one one-to-one, one, but that's the kind of movement or motion that the camera, image, camera's image stabilization could potentially have to compensate for and deal with. And so this is uh, actually, in fact, um, 
recognized by the CIPA and part of their testing standards. They have uh, five frequencies and five displacements that they use to produce an input into an apparatus to shake the camera. And the frequencies range from a tenth of a hertz all the way to 10 hertz. Uh, so 10 hertz a shake, a tenth of a hertz is that slow drift. And with displacements, now they use angular displacements, not linear displacements, because apparently according to their research, uh, pitch and yaw, angular uh, shifts, are the dominant factor in uh, most camera shake. Um, now, I can't validate how true that is because I obviously haven't done my own research into this, but going with what they've come up with, so their, at their one-tenth hertz uh, shift, uh, which to put some perspective on it would uh, mean a, uh, they have an angular displacement of uh, two degrees, plus or minus, so to put some perspective on it, that would be... Uh, a tenth of a hurt would be um, a 10 second sort of exposure. It's a 10 second cycle. And in their 10 hurt sample, the, uh, they have an angular, angular displacement of a tenth of a degree, plus or minus. So, you know, clearly they're, uh, they're seeing the same, or they're testing for the same things. I'll put a chart up uh, of these things uh, just so you can see what the, the, the uh, displacements and stuff is. Um, but so clearly they're testing for these things. Now, where all of this kind of becomes sort of challenging as a third party observer, uh, interested party in all of this, is the CIPA actual testing standards is uh, to get the whole standard, well, uh, first of all, uh, they're in a Japanese industry trade group. So um, that's not to say that an American company or whatever couldn't join, because you can, uh, but the primary working language of the trade group is Japanese. And there's one of the things that I found very challenging as a non-Japanese speaking person reading the, or reading Japanese person for that matter, uh, reading through the English translations of the standards is I found them to be a bit confusing. Now, some of that could certainly be because I'm not an expert in this area or even practicing in this area of engineering. And so uh, I'm just not up to terms on how, you know, on the terminology that they're using. And some of it is partly that I think they're using terminology, you know, as many times as this happens when you go from a technical field like sciences and engineering to sort of a more lay field, like say as photographers, um, there are a lot of instances where the, uh, Photographers will appropriate a term from the engineers, but then use it to mean something different. And so there's uh, a certain level where I'm not sure on their terminology, what they're meaning. I kind of get the drift, but it's kind of challenging to read through in the English standard, just on the grounds that uh, it's not the primary language that the standards are written in. Uh, but to actually be able to validate and verify all this, you need to be a CIPA member and you need to have uh, the right test equipment and the software that is used to evaluate the images, uh, the, uh, the document calls it Findblur software, is as far as I can tell only available to CIPA members for testing. Uh, so that said, there are ways, even though it's a standard, there are ways to... Um, manufacturers to stack the deck. Uh, for example, they don't have to test the lens at all focal lengths. They can test a lens at the focal length where it performs best. And unfortunately, I can't throw the citation up for this because I can't find it anymore. Uh, but when I was looking at Canon's uh, 16 to 35, back when I bought mine, the 16 to 35 F4 LIS USM wide ang ultra wide angle zoom, uh, 
uh, there was a note that I ran across somewhere in either the manual or something that basically said uh, four stops of image stabilization under their testing thing at 35 millimeters less, I, I think I want to say two stops, but again, I, I can't cite it, so I'm hesitant to even bring it up, uh, less at wider angles. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, camera companies can test on the camera that is the best performing in terms of uh, blur. So, for example, Canon tests their EF lenses on the EOS 1DX or 1DX Mark II, and presumably now that they've got the 1DX Mark III, the 1DX Mark III. Uh, they don't test it on the 5D Mark IV, and they don't test it on the 5DS. And resolution becomes a consideration. It's a depending on uh, how you look at things there's an issue or there can be issues with resolution when you start talking about camera shake and image blur. I've talked about in previous articles how when I've moved to high resolution cameras like this 5D Mark IV, the, uh, the shutter speeds that I needed to get acceptably sharp images based on pixel sharpness uh, doubled over the quote hand-holding rule of thumb. And all of this came down to, you know, I was shooting at 10 megapixels, then 20 megapixels, and now 30 megapixels. And as the resolution increased, it became more demanding of technique and lens for the same uh, quality image or the same uh, sharpness image at the pixel level. And, you know, since I'm on the topic, I, now is as good a time as any to, to sort of just bring up the hand-holding rule of thumb. Uh, Lots of people like to talk about it, but it's actually, and I think there's a lot of people that in photography that sort of rely on it, but they don't necessarily grasp the mechanics and systems behind it. So as best as I can tell, and I've done a lot of research into trying to find where the origins of the hand-holding rule of thumb came from, but as best as I can tell, it was an empirically derived rule of thumb, so it's not a, a, a law, it's a rule of thumb, going back to film cameras. And obviously, if you're not familiar with it, the hand-holding rule of thumb is that for not having camera shake in your images, you need to shoot at a shutter speed equal to one over the focal length of the lens. Uh, for a small format camera, at least, I, I think it holds true for large for or larger format, but I'm not entirely sure anymore. Uh, I don't use them, so I don't pay much attention to them. Uh, but anyway, the hand-holding rule of thumb, it, it certainly dates back to film. Uh, it's not a digital thing. It's not something that comes up in, uh, you know, came up in the digital era. It goes back to film. And it's talking about hand, uh, not having camera shake, sharp images and not having camera shake. Uh, but you have to look at it in the context of how you evaluate a sharp image not having camera shake. So there's a certain level of mysticism around hand or around film that I see sort of crops up in the people who never have used it with, you know, is, have grown up or had their entire photography career on digital systems. And when they start talking about film, I see things where uh, you know, the film had tremendous dynamic range and they do all kinds of hoop jumping and math and stuff to show that, you know, this film had really like 18 stops of dynamic range and our digital cameras aren't anywhere near close to that and so on and so forth. And yet the reality is, is that because it's an analog system, that 18 stops isn't really available. Like it's not just do a little math and you get it. Uh, the same thing applies to resolution. Uh, I see a lot of people that, in talking about, well, a lot of people, again, coming from a purely digital background and talking about film, they go, well, it's analog. It's infinite resolution. And the reality is it's not. The, the silver halide crystals in the, the emulsion that actually make it sensitive to light aren't infinitely small. They have a discrete size. And in fact, when you start digging into the 
uh, digital equivalent resolution of film, you kind of find that it's really not that good. Um, a, uh, a physics professor, astro, uh, astrophysics professor uh, named, I believe, uh, Roger Clark, uh, I'll put a link in the article for him, uh, or the description for his site, did some tests where he looked at the digital equivalent resolution of a variety of film stocks in small, medium, and large format. And what he found, or what he reported doing high resolution scans is that for very low uh, ISO films, so like ISO 50 film, you had a digital equivalent resolution between say 12 and 20 megapixels or 12 and 18 megapixels. Uh, I think he even says it's closer to 12 to 16 megapixels, but it's a, it's a nebulous uh, measure. It's, it's not something that can be easily or directly quantified, you know, quite the same way as you can count the number of pixels on a camera sensor and say there's 30 million pixels here. Um, and then as ISO went up at 200, it dropped below, t uh, you know, to around 10 or below to 8 to 10 megapixels. And by ISO 400, it was like 4 to 5, 4 to 6 megapixels. Um, that's what you're working with with film. And so there's, it's not this infinite pool of resolution. And what that means when it comes to talking about camera shake is there's a, a large, the larger your pixel, is the the broader that pixel um, it encompasses area so the lower the resolution of the film is and i'm using pixel in loose terms here to kind of mean film grain or digital pixels uh, the more room there is for a well-focused point of light to shift around without causing blur because the at the film or sensor level it's being all measured or all combined into one sort of precise spot. So the higher the resolution, therefore, the, the less tolerance there is for uh, movement before you start blurring that detail across or that point or that de point or detail across multiple pixels, pixels or film grains and developing blur. And so we cling to this hand-holding rule of thumb, and we cling to this, uh, you know, idea that you can shoot at one over the focal length, but on the same token, we're working with cameras that have sort of radically higher resolutions than you had on small format film. The, uh, the 30 megapixels of this 5D Mark IV is kind of unheard of in, if you start looking at small format films. There may be some niche, very slow speed black and white films that are uh, you know more than capable or more than uh, capable of uh, dealing with that or providing that kind of resolution but it's certainly not is is not something that you would get in most if not all color films uh, and when you start getting into the 40 megapixels 50 and 60 megapixel range uh, you're talking about digital equivalent uh, or digital cameras small format digital cameras that have resolutions that are roughly equivalent to what you got out of a medium format film camera uh, and you know again depending on the film stock uh, but way above what you would get out of small format film camera and so part of in some respects this whole discussion is a lot of this information is relative to the hand-holding rule of thumb and the hand-holding rule of thumb one over the focal length isn't as relevant now as it was even 10 years ago. So on a 20 megapixel 5D Mark III or 5D Mark II, uh, I could sort of rely on the hand-holding rule of thumb to get uh, pixel sharp images. On a 30 megapixel 5D Mark IV, I can't. I have to shoot at a stop faster or I more often than not have images that are blurred at the pixel level. Uh, of course, this opens up a number of questions about pixels and pictures and so on and so forth, but that's a topic for another discussion. Um, so that's a question with respect to how all of the image stabilization is working, because the higher resolution the camera is, the more sensitive at a pixel level the images uh, or the, the blur the picture will be too blur. You'll, you'll see it when you're looking at the picture at 100% magnification. 
And I think this is a big reason why uh, Canon, for instance, uses the 1DX, because it's the lowest resolution full frame camera that they have to do, uh, I mean, it's also got the most computational power, highest performance uh, in most other respects. So, I mean, it, there could be uh, reasons in there, but it's the one of the lowest or the lowest resolution uh, full frame camera they have. And so at, if you're evaluating blur on a pixel level, which I don't exactly know how the CIPA software is working, because obviously I don't have it, uh, it would, have a wider, uh, a larger tolerance for shake before that shake showed up as blur. Um, so let's talk about problems sort of to overcome the, the image stabilization system. Like I said, the biggest issue is us moving. We're not that stable. Uh, but there are limit, inherent limitations and they have inherent sort of issues that you can't just dance around. Uh, so one of them is, is the, the big one, obviously, is that there has to be an image to move. The, the image, you can't shift uh, outside the image circle of the lens, or you can't shift the image, uh, the, the sensor under uh, the shutter or outside the image circle the, uh, you know, of the lens. So there's, there's really a limited range to which the auto or the image stabilization system can make shifts. Now, obviously you could increase the, say the image circle, uh, the lens's image circle, but doing so increases the glass, it increases the mass of the lens, it increases the size of the lens, uh, it increases the lens mount, um, and so on and so forth, the size of all of this stuff, because you need to be able to project a bigger and bigger uh, image circle. As I said, sensors can only be so far, moved so far. It's a, a micro mechanical system that's moving the sensor around. And that micro mechanical system only has so much reach, so much range. Uh, and what this sort of really means, in, oh, well, and the third thing is the camera, the, the physical design of the camera body itself. So the, the shutter. You know, now mirrorless cameras, of course, have an advantage here because they don't have the depth of a mirror box, but the mirror box, but even if you look on a mirrorless camera, the sensor doesn't sit right at the lens mount where it's completely unobstructive. There's uh, generally a shutter in front of it. There's, uh, you know, which is a few millimeters. It can be made fairly large compared to the sensor or made to, you know, provide ample clearance, let's say, compared to the sensor. Uh, but you also have uh, you know, a plastic housing to cover the electronics that are unnecessarily, you know, don't need to be or shouldn't be exposed. You have the contacts at the bottom of the lens mount that have to protrude in such a way that the, uh, you know, lens can make contact with them and so on and so forth. And so there, there are limitations within the lenses and the cameras that impose a maximum constraint. Now, uh, where where you sort of run into, like, I don't want to say issues, it's kind of the opposite of issues. We're looking at the two factors, you have shake and you have, as I said, drift. Well, shake, of course, is going to be something that's going to be entirely responsive or, or based on the responsiveness of moving lens elements or sensors. So the smaller the sensor or the lighter the sensor or the lighter the lens elements, the faster they can be shifted and the faster they can keep up with or more accurately they can keep up with shake. And it doesn't have to necessarily be 100% instantaneous, uh, you know, or 100% in sync because the sort of overall objective of the image stabilization isn't necessarily to keep the auto or, or the, the focused light on one pixel 100% of the time, but to keep it on that pixel for enough of the exposure that the errors when it drips off that pixel are such a small component to the other pixels that they don't show up as blur. So, you know, like maybe 90% of the time or 95% of the time it has to be on, but it can drift off, uh, you know, in the the few microseconds that it takes for the lens to, uh, element to adjust or something to that effect. Um, so, 
the shake is sort of, in some ways, I think the lesser issue. I think in a lot of cases, shake is something that's generally been dealt with to a point that, uh, you know, if you didn't have the larger drift component of our motion, uh, we'd probably see much better or longer uh, stabilization compensation times just on the premise that the camera, you know, can keep the drive and servos and the error rates uh, in the accelerometer data down enough that the uh, sensor shakes. The real problem with these super high, you know, kind of ridiculous discussion, in, in my opinion at least, uh, uh, image stabilization capabilities really comes down to talking about drift. Um, so to put some, ex it, it, um, to put some perspective on this, in the Canon rumor thing, they were talking seven to eight stops, and I just randomly picked eight stops for these numbers because it was uh, convenient to do in my head or whatever. Uh, but what does that translate to? Well, for a 500 millimeter lens, again, using the hand-holding rule of thumb, you would be talking about going from one five hundredth of a second to a half second exposure. Now, you do this test, you look away for a half second, you're, you're probably going to be okay on that. And that could potentially, like, I, I don't see a tremendous amount of uh, issue in that respect that a 500 millimeter lens couldn't be stabilized seven to eight stops. Uh, but let's talk about a 15 millimeter lens. So normally under the hand holding rule of thumb, a 15 millimeter lens would need to have a 15th of a second exposure. Eight stops slower than that is 15 seconds. Now, I'm almost positive that I cannot, without looking at it, keep my finger anywhere within half an inch or an inch of where I point it, set it up to do this experiment at over 15 seconds. Uh, I'm just sitting here doing this video, I'm seeing I'm moving around a little bit more than maybe I normally would, uh, and I'm sort of off to the side, and that's a less stable position than, say, in front of me, and I'm not pushed against my head, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's not exactly identical conditions, obviously, but in just two or three seconds, I'm finding my fingers moving at least a half inch, if not a bit more. And that's not a shift that I think is available in, it's certainly not happening on an, uh, a, an IBIS sensor. Uh, they're not moving sensors a half an inch, uh, you know, displacement in one direction. Uh, lenses might get away with it a little better because of the fact that you can get a lot of shift out of a small amount of movement in the lens relative to the picture. Uh, but you start getting into where this starts sounding relatively improbable to me. So, um, it's not to say, I, I guess there's two sort of big takeaways to make here. So the first one is that the, uh, the biggest limiting factor, especially for really long uh, image stabilization compensation values, is less the camera and the lens and more our own ability to stay in one place precisely enough for the camera and the lens to deal with. The uh, second major uh, takeaway I think to take here is that image stabilization isn't just one number. Even though that's what's presented, it's not necessarily going to, I mean, this is certainly the case when you start talking about zoom lenses, and it's certainly the case when you start talking about in-body image stabilization. But even to a lesser extent, it's, uh, you know, if, with a prime lens, it's going to vary depending on the camera that the lens is mounted on and your standards. So, I mean, Obviously, again, CIPA, their standards for the camera industry, but, you know, as a photographer, like, my standards are pixel sharp. We don't have a, enough resolution, and our image processing software isn't designed with the intention yet of working at uh, non-pixel scale 
uh, operations. So we're still doing sharpening in pixels of radius instead of uh, millimeters or microns or some unit that translates to a print size or something to that effect. We're not working in linear unit or in in real world units. We're working in pixels, and so long as that remains to be the case, remains the case. Uh, we run into, or there's definitely issues with where are your standards versus what the camera industry is saying is going to be acceptable. Uh, and so, like I said, on a, uh, even on a prime lens, if you're not using the same test cameras or you're holding yourself to a higher standard of terms of sharpness, you're not going to see quite the same capabilities out of that camera and sensor as what's being advertised. Uh, but when you get into zooms, uh, you know, you have a tremendous range usually, even when you start talking about 2x just or just 2x zooms, but you have a tremendous range of sort of variability in the demands of where the lens, what the lens uh, is going to place on the camera or in terms of image stabilization. And as I said, the camera manufacturers, the lens manufacturers, they don't need to provide data in the worst case. They need to provide data, or they can provide data for only the best case. So like a 16 to the, the 16 to 35 F4 that I mentioned earlier, uh, they can provide the 35 millimeters on a 20 megapixel camera. That's almost certainly the best case scenario for that lens and that they're claiming four stops. And as I said, somewhere I had come across a number that said at 16 millimeters, it's more like two, two and a half stops. Uh, that's the kind of thing you could expect. So if you're like, if you're not expecting there to be a difference in resolution or a difference in image stabilization over the zoom range, uh, that's something you kind of have to think about too. And then of course, in-body image stabilization, the camera has its own performance capabilities, but you know, now we're talking essentially like the zoom lens is the entire range of lenses that are offered for the camera. It's not going to perform, just the simple reality of it is, is the camera is not going to perform at the full extent of its rated capabilities or marketed capabilities at say 10 millimeters as it would at say 500 millimeters or maybe even somewhere in between. Cause I mean, obviously as you get to bigger, heavier lenses, they get heavier and that makes you shake more cause you're straining more to hold the lens up. So like I said, going into this, uh, I'm not an expert in image stabilization, but I've never really seen an awful lot of people talk about sort of the problems, the challenges, the engineering, and the ins and outs of what's going on. And so, well, this has been a lot longer ramble on image stabilization than I think I had intended when I sat down and wrote notes for this and started to want to record this. Uh, I hope this has sort of shed some light on sort of the bigger picture around image stabilization that isn't necessarily shared by the camera industry when they're talking, you know, when you get a single number in the marketing data. Um, so, uh, as I said, this has run a lot longer than I had anticipated. If you've made it this far, thanks for watching. Uh, again, it's tremendously, uh, you know, I've, I've eaten up a tremendous amount of your time, so I hope this was at least informative. Uh, if you found this interesting, please smash the like button. If you're interested in more video content on cameras, uh, technology, uh, currently I'm doing a lot of work on talking about video and per learning to shoot video, uh, but I have some bigger plans, especially getting back into travel as soon as I can start traveling again, or start as soon as I get to start traveling again. Uh, but uh, please consider subscribing to this channel. Um, if you're interested in more written content on this kind of matter, uh, please check out my website at pointsandfocus.com. I will slam a uh, link in the description for that. And as I said, thanks for watching and until next time.